This session will be chaired by Rear Admiral Jones and follow the same format as our morning ones. And a reminder that should you have any questions, please use the Sea Power 22 app. Once our speakers conclude around 14.10, we will then start question and answer time. Rear Admiral Jones joined the Royal Australian Navy in 1988. He commanded the frigate HMAS Newcastle and the replenishment vessel HMAS Success twice. He has also been the director of the Sea Power Centre Australia, the Director General of Operations at Headquarters Joint Operations Command, and is now the Maritime Border Protection Commander. So welcome, and I invite you to commence the session. Uh, thanks, Kat, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, session five, Maritime Security, part one. Maritime grey zone activities, understanding the contest, disputes, and competition. In recent years, maritime grey zone activities have been undertaken by state and non-state actors. These include Spain against Gibraltar in 2014 and 2015. Russia employed grey zone tactics against the Ukraine in 2014, again in 2018, and insert ellipsis, we're watching it play out before our very eyes and probably not seeing a lot of what is going on. The environmental group, Sea Shepherd Organisation, employed grey zone tactics against Japanese whalers for a decade between 20, 2007 and 2017. However, the Indo-Pacific is experiencing firsthand the impacts of maritime grey zone actions. State-sponsored grey zone actions have three key pillars. First is the requirement of strategic divergence which involves a patient, diplomatic and economic campaign to influence the existing international norms. Second, grey zone actions are deliberately ambiguous. The purpose is to exploit the normative concepts of conflict and competition to avoid provocation and kinetic responses from other states. Last, and linked to the first pillar, is patience. Successful grey zone activities employ gradual incrementalism. Simply put, these activities are calibrated over a significant period as small actions don't generate significant responses. In the past decade, fishing vessels have gained prominence within the Indo-Pacific as tools of the state for the advancement of national policy. Countering this challenge is not only essential it's within the limits of any state's strategic imagination. This session, we hope, will deep dive into the prevailing Indo-Pacific maritime challenge, conundrum even. Ladies and gentlemen, your keynote speaker today is Dr. John Lee. Dr. Lee is also Senior Fellow Non-Resident at the United States Studies Centre and Adjunct Professor at the University of Sydney. He received his master's and doctorate in international relations from the University of Oxford and his Bachelor of Laws and Arts degrees, first class in philosophy, from the United, uh, University of New South Wales. Dr Lee will frame the broader geopolitical environment which has seen the rise of uh, grey zone activities. Joining Dr Lee on stage this afternoon after his speech will be your panel of experts. First, Mr Ashley Townsend is Director of Foreign Policy and Defence at the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. Mr Townsend works on international security and strategic affairs with a focus on the Indo-Pacific, including regional alliances and partnerships, maritime security, defence policy, and US, Chinese, and Australian strategy. Uh, and if I may, Ashley, I'm going to embarrass you because Ashley's most recent news is that he has been appointed to the Carnegie Endowment as Senior Fellow for Indo-Pacific Security. Uh, second is Professor Leslie Seebeck, who is the CEO of Cyber21, an honorary professor at the Australian National University. Professor Seebeck has extensive experience in strategy, policy, management, budget, information technology and research roles in the Australian public service, industry and academia. Professor Seebeck has a PhD in information technology, an MBA, a master's in defence studies and a bachelor's degree in applied science physics. Uh, now these uh, first two, uh, first three individuals, sorry, are well known to me uh, and, uh, and we worked together at various stages in 2013 when I was the director of the Sea Power Centre 
uh, as debate around a, a third way or maritime uh, strategic school of thought for Australia was being debated uh, in our various forums. Additionally, we welcome to Australia Commander Caroline Tucker of the Royal Navy. Uh, Commander Tucker became the lead legal ad advisor in international and operational law within the Royal Navy. A current focus in her work is the applicability of international maritime law to the maritime operation of uncrewed vessels. She's also completed a master's by research in international law through the University of Exeter, exploring the legal issues of sub-threshold operations in the maritime environment. And with all of those introductions done, I will hand over to our keynote speaker, Dr. John Lee. Uh, thank you, Admiral. It's an uh, honour to share the uh, panel with, with my colleagues as well. Uh, thank you to the Sea Power for inviting me and thank you all for uh, attending and giving us your time. Uh, my briefest mention is to speak about understanding the contest uh, disputes and competition be behind maritime grey zone activities uh, in the Indo-Pacific, particularly East Asia. Now, we no longer have to whisper the truth that this question arises because of what the People's Republic of China is doing. Uh, this is a conversation which is taking place in every gathering like this, uh, which means the challenge for me is to say something which isn't boring, but which is interesting and useful uh, about why China uh, is doing what it's doing uh, and why it's uh, undertaking its grade zone activities and what its objectives might be. Now, we all know the definition of grade zone activity and Rear Admiral has, has uh, gone through that. So I won't get bogged down in definitions. Uh, in this context, let, let me just define it very broadly as Chinese geopolitical, economic, military, cyber, and information operations beyond regular diplomatic and economic activities, uh, which does not involve military kinetic force and which is below the threshold that would cause a military response. Now, the last sign, as we know, is the critical one, below the threshold that would cause a military response. It is critical because what is uh, below the threshold that would cause us to respond militarily is a fundamentally subjective standard. That is, the threshold is a psychological or a political standard. It is not a mechanical or quantitative or necessarily even a military uh, standard. Now, the essence is this. How does China make it less likely that the United States and allies uh, and other countries will respond with military action, thereby giving China even more room to operate successfully in a grey zone? Uh, before I get, get to that, let me talk about what China wants and how the grey zone fits into all of this. Now, I'll begin with a very uh, simple question, or at least a very basic question. What is China's vision of success? Uh, and in, to answer that, let me, be, let me start with an anecdote. Uh, I began my role as um, the senior advisor to the Turnbull Bishop governments in early 2016. Uh, in the first week uh, on a job in taking this role, uh, I was invited by the Chinese ambassador and his deputy uh, for dinner. And, it's my job to, to attend these things, so of course I went. Now, during the evening, which is very pleasant, uh, they put this proposition to me. They accepted that Australia was a long-standing ally of the United States. But to ensure Australia's long-term standing and security and prosperity, it was put to me that we should remain on the sidelines, uh, if not neutral, at least passive in strategic and military terms. Now, the proposition put to me was that for the sake of Australia's long-term interests, we should step back and allow the US and China to sort out the differences to giants in a region. And in the meantime, we should just continue to benefit from selling them our commodities and services. Now, it's obvious why China would want this. It's, it's all about geography and numbers. The United States is more than 11,000 kilometres away from Asia. It has one uh, base in Guam, uh, one, one of its own bases in Guam, but it cannot maintain its military and strategic presence without the assistance of allies such as Australia, Japan and South Korea. If allies such as us remain neutral or passive, uh, 
then the United States eventually ceases to be a significant presence in Asia, and then the iron law of numbers take over. As you know, China uh, spends more each year than the combined military budgets of East Asia, South Asia, and Oceania put together. Without the United States, there is no balance. Beijing knows this, and it is why the ambassador and his deputy urged me to advise my political masters to adopt a more neutral stance. If they do so, then of course China is a few steps further on its way uh, to getting its way in the region. Now we know the opposite has occurred. Uh, China's behaviour has activated and energised alliances. This has caused Beijing to put even more emphasis on grey zone activities to achieve its objectives in maritime Asia. Now what are these objectives? We know China wants to coerce, it wants to seduce, it wants to be accepted as a legitimate leader in a region. In this sense, China is not just a brutal military power, it wants to be a legitimate, preeminent and comprehensive power. Now, as we know, modern day China is ultimately about the Chinese Communist Party and the CCP, uh, in my view, has two core objectives if you were really to, uh, to sort of narrow it down to, to what it really wanted. One, it wants to maintain the viability of its state-led political economy and promote and entrench elements of this political economy in the region. And this is, as we know, largely what the Belt and Road Initiative is about. And two, it wants to or it needs to continually shrink the strategic, military, economic, political and normative ground in the region on which uh, the United States can sustain and build and demonstrate its power and influence. This is because, as mentioned, China knows there is no balance without the United States. Now, if these are the two core objectives, what are the approaches to uh, get there? And I would nominate five. The first one is uh, Beijing seeks to simplify and reduce the complexity of the strategic map in the Indo-Pacific. For China, the fewer active strategic players, the better. The Chinese ideal is that other regional states remain on the sidelines in casting the strategic competition as only between the Americans and a small band of stubborn allies such as us on the one hand and China on the other. Two, uh, China seeks to manipulate, persuade, or else compel smaller states, which is pretty much every other state in the region except the United States, seeks to manipulate, persuade, or else compel smaller regional states to focus on absolute rather than relative gains. Now this works for China because China is invariably the larger or more powerful party and Chinese entities tend to be in a better position to negotiate a better relative outcome for itself in any arrangement or agreement. However, Beijing, as we know, will often present guaranteed absolute gains to the smaller side to entice them to enter into an agreement. The intended consequence is that these countries find themselves more reliant on Chinese acquiescence and largesse over time, but in a weaker relative position to China. Now, the third approach they have, in every context, military, economic, uh, diplomatic, and so, so on, China seeks to ensure its willingness and capacity to escalate is more credible than either Americas or any other regional states, thereby re uh, reduce, reducing the resolve of that other state. Four, Beijing seeks to convey the message that it is fundamentally undeterrable in that it will pay any cost to achieve its objectives. It also seeks to convince us that its objectives, and we know what they are, that its objectives are permanent and unchanging and its success is therefore inevitable as a result. And a fifth thing China needs to do, it needs to normalise forms of Chinese uh, behaviour, especially coercion. Uh, this has the effect of not only offering Beijing a broader toolkit for statecraft, but it eventually leads to the acceptance and internalization of such Chinese behavior by other states. Now, this is getting to how China is seeking to manipulate and influence the way we think about resistance and the desirability and even possibility of using military force. That is, this is about the extent to which it can operate in and succeed uh, in grey zone activities. Now, all of these uh, approaches or strategies mentioned enlarge uh, 
not just a tactical space, but the psychological and political space within which China can successfully operate in the grey zone. For example, if it can convince us its willingness to escalate will always exceed ours, not just uh, on the water, but in political and economic terms, then we lose every time in the grey zone. If we focus on absolute rather than relative gains, uh, then we will have very strong incentives to de-escalate or ignore what China is doing because our objective is to protect any prospect of profit or gain rather than risk that through diplomatic or military escalation and response. Now, this is a real problem because the entire region has been conditioned to accept the seeking or pursuit of absolute gains rather than relative gains since really the 1990s. The idea that we must give up a benefit or prevent a competitor from securing a relatively greater benefit is something that we're still getting used to uh, after the end of the Cold War. Moreover, if we begin to believe that the Chinese Communist Party is undeterrable, then why risk anything to resist grey zone activities in the first place? And if we believe that the Chinese Communist Party's objectives are permanent and unchanging, then the same logic applies. Why bother to escalate? Now, if we have normalised or internalised coercive Chinese behaviour, as many of us have done, not in this room, but many of us, in, uh, many people in our countries, um, then we seek not to deprive China of pocketing and entrenching any gain, but we merely hope to reduce the extent of the gain that uh, China achieves. So to explain this in, in, a, in a different, more uh, uh, layperson's way, I would offer the following analogy. It is like living next to a neighbour uh, with whom you know is hostile and unpleasant and with whom there are no agreed boundaries. Now, every few months, he tries to move his fence one metre into what you think is your land. Whenever this occurs, and because you already expect and accept that he's going to do this, uh, you seek to ensure his fence only moves 50 centimetres, not one metre, into your perceived land. So at best, you'll still lose 50 centimetres of your land every month. Now, add to this a considerable and successful uh, effort and resources China has put into elite uh, co-optation and capture throughout the region, uh, which is largely about getting elites to support the strategies I just spoke about on Chinese terms. Uh, finally, there is a fundamental difference in mindset in terms of uh, the way China views us and the way we view China. We view China as a competitor, some might even say a rival, uh, but China views us as an enemy. And this is not me trying to put forward an alarmist interpretation. Uh, this is clear in their documents, it's clear in their doctrines, and it's clear in their behaviour. China also has a far broader concept of war or warfare than we do. Uh, war does not have a beginning or an end. It need not be formally declared. Uh, it is ongoing. For China, war is not just kinetic, it's political, psychological, it's even cognitive. That is, it is about manipulating the way the enemy thinks uh, in a way that suits Chinese interests. Now, it's no coincidence that the one of the two organisations in charge of Chinese political warfare is the People's Liberation Army. It's not some uh, obscure um, civilian bureaucracy in the system. It is the People's Liberation Army, which is the one of, one of two organisations put in charge of political warfare. The other one is the United Front. Now, all of these reasons are why China has done well up till now uh, in, in the grey zone. Now, what do we do about it? I guess this is some of what the panel is about. Uh, but in offering some remarks in the lead up uh, to the panel, uh, it seems to me that it's about much more than just tactics on the ground or on the sea, as it were. Uh, we need to link issues, responding to what Chinese vessels are doing in the South China Sea with non-military uh, settings. Uh, we need to know when and how to escalate in non-military areas, something we're not uh, used to uh, for several decades. The way our government is set up, it's not well formulated, or it's not well set up to formulate uh, the linking of issues. You know, we still tend to operate in a defence and non-defence uh, world. Uh, we're not set up for comprehensive competition and cost imposition. At this stage, our conversation is much more about national resilience, as important as that is, uh, than it is about competition and cost imposition. 
And finally, we need to tell uh, better stories. And I know this sounds like a vague thing to say, uh, but as John Akila, who was a former analyst at RAND, he was an advisor to Norman Schwarzkopf, to John Hamray, the former Deputy Secretary of Defence, uh, and advisor to Secretary Rumsfeld. Uh, as Akila once put it, the side which tells the better story or narrative tends to win. China's narratives about its inevitable success, that it cannot be turned, that its objectives are permanent and so forth, have sapped resolve and strategic and tactical creativity. Under Xi Jinping, China has reversed the guiding philosophy of Deng Xiaoping, which was to hide capabilities, play down strengths and bide your time. China is now about promoting real and unreal strengths and hiding real and perceived weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Uh, so before we begin with panel, uh, my ending note is that we need to tell a better story about ourselves and we need to tell a more accurate story uh, about uh, China. Thank you, Admiral. I'll leave it you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, I've been in a number of speaking events uh, today, and that is the second time in a totally different forum that I've heard the idea about the importance of narrative, uh, which we may come back to uh, in, in Q&A. Uh, we welcome uh, Ashley Townsend for, uh, for his remarks. Thanks, Admiral. And John, I uh, really enjoyed your comments just now. I think uh, my brief on this panel is to talk a little bit about where, where John picked up on. Um, about what Australia and other countries in the region working collaboratively together, but also by reforming the way we do things, um, how we should respond to Chinese grey zone coercion, although I don't use the word respond, so please pick me up where on occasion I might slip, because I think the right mindset for us is to think a lot more about what we can do uh, to shift the burden of escalation back onto China. So we're trying to deny the capacity for effective grey zone coercion rather than only um, responding to it after the fact. Uh, John's already, I think, laid out very nicely uh, what the challenges of, of, of Chinese coercion are, and the way that I would put it is that Chinese maritime coercion is part of a broader pattern of its aggressive grey zone coercion in the region, uh, which appears designed to establish a Chinese sphere of influence by challenging the access, the influence, but also the sovereignty and political autonomy of Indo-Pacific nations, both on the water, both more broadly in the strategic environment, and indeed, as John has laid out nicely, within the polities and the psychology of countries in the region. Um, Australia's 2020 Defence Strategic Update is clear-eyed about the threat um, that grey zone coercion and activities pose to the regional order. And despite its limited official references to China, the DSU clearly expresses concern over China's use of cyber attacks, paramilitary forces, and I'm quoting here, militarization of disputed features, its use of exploiting influence, interference operations, and the coercive use of trade and economic levers. The, 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 the DSU also singles out ongoing coercion in the South China Sea and the potential establishment of military bases in Australia's immediate region, itself not a grey zone activity, but as we're seeing uh, potentially the beginnings within the Solomons, um, the, the end point of, of a long-standing co campaign of influence, um, of economic um, allure, and indeed of grey zone activity. These are the key vectors of Chinese grey zone coercion, and they form part of a wider strategy in which Beijing orchestrates influence campaigns and disinformation and other forms of political warfare at the low end. Economic leverage, cyber attacks, which I know Leslie's going to speak more about, coercive statecraft and other activities at the mid-level. And indeed, at the high end, conventional military threats and under the shadow of strategic nuclear escalation at the highest end. Uh, so again, in a similar way to the way John has laid things out, I think we need to see grey zone coercion and activities both in a continuum of, 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 co of competition, but also in a, in a cross-domain and, and hybridised way. And we've seen their effects. Uh, from everywhere in the region, from the South China Sea to the Solomon Islands, from the ratcheting up of pressure right now over Taiwan to Beijing's long-standing campaign of economic coercion against Australia. Uh, I think the key argument I want to make today is that a more assertive and imaginative uh, regional statecraft, and indeed born of a strategic imagination, which is one of the guiding themes of this panel, is needed if we are to successfully deter and push back against Chinese grey zone coercion, both in the maritime domain and beyond. And this fundamentally is not something that Australia can do by itself. 
nor is it something that can be done purely in the maritime domain. Um, as the CDF said in his comments yesterday, and I'm paraphrasing, we need an integrated approach to campaigning, one that brings together our advantages across the whole of government, civil society, the private sector, our allies, our partners, our regional friends, and all operating across all domains. Uh, in other words, uh, in order to deter and complicate China's efforts to build, uh, through coercive activities, a sphere of influence in the region, Australia and other like-minded parties must operate across the same multi-dimensional spectrum of competition that China uses to press its advantage. This requires deeper integration of tools. It requires levers and authorities um, that are available to us to be reformed to become more effective. It requires deeper regional partnerships with the aim of building collective resilience against Chinese coercion. And crucially, I think it requires us to make denial rather than punishment the organising principle of our national and collective strategy. And that's because a proactive approach to countering coercion uh, bolsters our own deterrence resolve when it comes to countering grey zone coercion. It suits our defensive status quo interests in the region. And it recognises what I think is the asymmetric strategic position that we occupy vis-a-vis -vis China, which makes cost imposition after the fact just that much less likely to really succeed in a majority of cases. So the defence strategic update has signalled the need for a more active approach to countering grey zone coercion, and it's built on the work of the 2017 foreign policy white paper in the Australian context, and indeed some of the work that John was involved in in his time in government. I'm not going to reprise those efforts right now. And of course, there has been a great deal of progress in the way Australia approaches um, foreign interference, um, uh, cyber security, the review of, um, of foreign direct investment, as well as the way that Australia engages with Pacific Island partners through the Pacific Step Up, the way that Australia works with maritime partners and other partners in Southeast Asia, and the way that we've used diplomatic solidarity, lawfare, presence operations, and um, ISR sharing with regional partners to build out collective resilience and collective strengths in responding to grey zone activity in particular on the water. The point I want to leave everyone with is that there's much more that needs to be done by Australia and much more that we need to do to reform our ways of doing business in order to get after this problem more effectively, as indeed it intensifies as and doesn't debate to despite our efforts. So in the, the second part of my comments here today, what I want to do is leave you with five specific ideas, albeit in no way exhaustive, that are derived from much of the work that we've done at the US Study Center over the last five years through a deterrence dialogue process where we've looked at a range of issues of deterrence, including counter coercion and counter gray zone coercion. First, Australia and its regional partners need to try to regain the initiative by actively seeking to disrupt China's gray zone activities and to shifting the burden of escalation back on Beijing. An active approach demands a much more creative use of existing military intelligence and economic levers now, but it also requires, and indeed the acceleration of a development of new or upgraded unorthodox capabilities that can complicate Chinese planning without attribution and in areas such as counter space, deception, and information seabed and unconventional warfare. Crucially, we must move beyond a mindset that views asymmetric tactics as a sole purview of the aggressor. For instance, um, electronic disruption against Chinese collection operations in the region, or the building of pockets of capability, influence, and capacity in countries across the region to resist, and indeed resist proactively, future attempts at coercion by China, provide cost-effective ways for us to build resilience and undercut China's approach to maritime, uh, to, to gray zone activity in the region. Second, as part of this approach, Australia and its regional partners should be starting to consider how they can impose their own grey zone dilemmas upon China rather than just responding to its. Again, as the CDF mentioned, uh, has mentioned in previous speeches, this involves thinking and acting in the grey zone ourselves. A mindset shift for our political system, I would wager, but also something which we can do and have done previously in legal, moral and ethical ways. The aim of this approach should be to force Chinese decision makers to balance their own grey zone conduct against the risk of triggering escalation and indeed to kind of break through the, the challenge that John laid out with regards to China's self-image and projection of an image of being undeterrable. 
Uh, this could involve efforts to create greater uncertainty for Beijing about the costs, for instance, of crossing um, Australian or allied or regional partners' red lines. Revealing or feigning the existence of cutting edge military capabilities may be in this regard useful. Likewise, targeted capacity building efforts with regional partners on ways to counter grey zone tactics or support unconventional operations by Australia in the future could also begin to complicate Chinese assumptions about the potential for future collective pushback and coordinated activity in responding to regional maritime coercion. Third, Australia and other highly capable regional countries, in particular the Quad partners, the US, Japan, Australia and India, should do more to empower maritime Southeast Asian and Pacific Islands countries to resist Chinese coercion directly and to defend their own sovereign and maritime interests. Uh, this again will require us to take greater risks, including by becoming more involved in maritime disputes and tensions in the region. We should and could share more military and intelligence domain awareness with these countries, step up the frequency of combined patrols in partnership with regional countries and in contested parts of the region, increase our permanent uh, liaison networks and capacity building networks in these countries, and provide direct and indeed tactical support to frontline partners in the region that are on the receiving end of Chinese coercion. New regionally driven initiatives uh, deserve our support. For instance, the nascent Indonesian, Malaysian and Filipino maritime air and land cooperation, a new uh, burgeoning trilateral um, uh, you know, cooperation in the region could benefit from the kind of behind the scenes support in terms of ISR, in terms of other kind of military capacity building support that Australia and others could provide. Similarly, we must be more willing to provide the kind of practical and tangible support that regional partners uh, want and, and have often been asking for in order to strengthen their own military, paramilitary and maritime forces. Even if, as Evan Luxmana suggested this morning, that this does not always come with tighter political alignment with the West and indeed strengthens them for a range of contingencies. In an era of great power competition, Australia has to take the region as it is rather than hoping for the region that it wants on all fronts. Fourth, Australia and its regional partners should agree where they can on common red lines for high impact grey zone scenarios and then work backwards to prepare collectively to deter, or if this fails, to respond to them in the future. Uh, this could and should include grey zone escalation by China over Taiwan or a Ukraine style, a Ukraine 2014 style, that is little green man hybrid style conflict in parts of Southeast Asia or the Pacific. Clear red lines and agreed on procedures for defending them are vital for deterring uh, Chinese coercion and they do provide assurance to regional partners, galvanise public support for a commitment in question. But they must begin by identifying what specific grey zone actions, for instance, cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, um, would constitute unacceptable behaviour and then proceed towards developing collective responses ahead of time. This will be difficult. Regional countries, indeed, even close allies like Australia and the United States, although they have shared interests and common goals, have a range of different proximate concerns. So brokering this is not straightforward. But it is also critical that we include these countries and a wider range, rather, of regional countries in these discussions, because for Australia and for many of the countries represented here today, the kind of most likely regional uh, grey zone activities that we will um, encounter over the next five to ten years are not necessarily a high-end uh, escalation in places like Taiwan, but involved a range of lower stakes and much more proximate um, 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 contingencies that will appear in the region and require the participation of or be played out in the countries of regional partners. And finally, to, to, to end my comments, in order to orchestrate uh, complex grey zone and counter grey zone actions, we need to accelerate our efforts to reform our bureaucratic structures and authorities in ways that can more effectively knit together diplomatic, intelligence, economic, development assistance and informational tools of statecraft. Uh, John mentioned as well, I think, the need for reform with regards to the way that we are organised across a spectrum of competition. This needs to happen both within Australia and our 
um, and our um, uh, public service, as well as in the architecture that connects us with key regional allies and partners. There are a range of suggestions for how this can be done, ranging from the establishment of a National Security Council type organisation in some part of the Australian public service, to the formalisation of different kinds of alliance management architecture between Australia and the United States, or indeed the strengthening of new forms of regional partnerships between Australia and, and countries in maritime Southeast Asia or the Pacific. All of these merit our attention and I don't think there's time or space to go through those suggestions now, but suffice to say that although there has been progress over the last decade, if we are to reform institutionally to deal with the challenges that John has laid out, then further and faster diplomat, um, um, bureaucratic reform will be required. Um, these are far from the only answers. They are the but the tip of an iceberg of a body of work that the US Study Centre has been working on in collaboration with Pacific Forum over the last few years. But I hope that they will, to take uh, Sean Andrews' brief for this panel, begin a process by which we can reflect on um, how we can show greater strategic imagination to deal with the problems of grey zone coercion. Thank you. Moving right along. Okay, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Justin, and uh, uh, thank you for the Sea Power Centre for having me here today. I've been asked to speak about cyber, uh, and uh, as you'll know, as you probably will know from the you know the picture on the slide, you know it's going to be about cyber because there's a guy with a hoodie. Uh, not only that, there's lots of screens, and there's blue light, which is dead giveaway. So that's a common conception about cyber. The problem is, of course, that the cyber is simply it's ubiquitous, it is simply the, the dark side of every device we carry in our pockets. Uh, everything we do touches on cyber. You cannot escape it, it is, it is there, con continuing the environment. The other image of cyber, which I think is actually gets in the way of us thinking sensibly about this topic, is this one. The idea of a cyber Pearl Harbor, you know, that's not going to happen. And I'll go into the reasons, and I'm drawing on the lessons from Ukraine, why that's not going to happen. But the Cyber Pearl Harbor has, you know, has been brought into the, in the public dialogue because of the, sort of, you know, the shock and awe of that value or the effect of this. And it's particularly apt in that maritime domain. More, this is actually the better conception of cyber. Cyber is corrosive. It erodes trust. It undermines your belief or your, your, your confidence in the systems you are using. And that, that extends right down deep in the tech stack up to, you know, again, that human interaction. How do you know that the information that you're getting or your public is getting, your decision makers are getting is right? And it can corrode and essentially it just leaves that capability bereft. And if we're talking about, again, Chinese uh, interest and what it's trying to do in, the, uh, in that grey zone you know, um, area, I think John's put it very well. It's trying to undermine and simplify by taking out those actors and undermining our capability and capacity to, to act. If we look at what's happened in the most recent um, demonstration of how cyber plays out in a warfare situation, the Ukraine is a perfect example. Many people had expected, and even General Campbell said the other day, that you could sort of expect to sort of see cyber as that lead in of a, you know, the, uh, the flagging of a imminent uh, kinetic campaign. The reality has been a little different. Uh, yes, there were attacks, but there's been what we've been witnessing over the last 10, 15, 20 years is an increase in that um, level of latency, cyber latency in the environment. It is ongoing. It is constant. Not only that, but the most effective campaigns tend to be either the short-term ransomware campaigns undertaken essentially by criminal actors, and I'll put North Korea in that category as well, or they're the long-term slow build-up of intelligence access. So what you saw in uh, Solar Winds, for example, with the Russian intelligence service putting a lot of slow work into sort of you know, positioning things and just waiting and collecting a lot of stuff, even though their targets out of all those systems that were affected were you know, relatively few. So we're seeing this sort of slow build-up of, of uh, cyber. We're seeing it just rise in the environment. It is no longer the indicator we thought it might be. So some of the lessons so far of, of Ukraine has been adaptation. If Russia had gone into the Ukraine expecting to have the effect that they had in 2013, 2014, they forgot that the other side gets a vote as well. The Ukrainians took the lessons and took that experience and changed their systems. And they updated their systems, not just their military, 
but a lot of their social systems and infrastructure. And so what the Russians anticipated would happen didn't necessarily happen. But we've seen, witnessed a lot of other adaptation and innovation, both on the battlefield, but also in the cyber realm as well. So you get this very fast attack defense um, evolution going on. So they've learned, they've picked up, etc. And we can take that too. I mean, we should also be thinking in those terms. We need both that sort of, right, let's adapt our systems. We know more or less longer term what this is going to do, but we also have a very fast turnaround. You know, and again, this comes down to individual agents. This is not where you want dinosaur brains. You want the sort of small swarms and individual agents with agency who can, can do things. The second thing is spillovers. So the lesson of WannaCry and not Petya is, again, a, sort of, you know, a, a cyber attack can have a global spillover. So the effect you might be looking for might be local. But the battlefield, in that sense, is regional, but the spillovers are global. And so there's, again, an anticipation. Uh, if we do this, perhaps we shouldn't use that particular um, that tool or tool set because it might get out there. And once things are out in the wild, they're gone. Everyone can use them. The next one is underlying infrastructure. So there is a, a theory that the Russians didn't take out the Ukrainian infrastructure because they depended on it. They'd anticipated being able to occupy Ukraine. They needed the infrastructure to be able to undertake that occupation. But the other thing, of course, is that, yes, they did take out some satellite systems. There were spillover effects to Europe more generally. But we've also seen innovations such as Elon Musk's uh, Starlink. Interestingly, um, I think up until about February, that time of invasion, global Starlink customers were about 250,000 globally, US, some here in Australia, um, Britain, etc. cetera. Uh, since uh, Musk has delivered uh, Starlink to Ukraine, Ukraine alone has added another 150,000 users. So very fast uptake of what we would always thought of being, a, you know, again, that underlying infrastructure. Uh, dependencies. For all the fact we talk about some of this stuff as being a military tool for military um, assets and effects, and particularly if we're talking about effects-based outcomes, this is fundamentally a civilian capability. It's run by civilians, it's built by civilians using civilian business models. So we have to be aware of those dependencies here. This is not something where, again, we can sort of have a military-only program. It's deep in the civilian world with effects on civilian economies and societies. This is a civilian de decision making in the de decision making realm. Uh, the problem, of course, in cyber is unpredictability. So for all the effect that, again, problem about the cyber Pearl Harbor analogy, again, particularly in the effects based world, right, we can do this. It's going to happen. Well, no, it's not. And it's that very unpredictability which makes commanders very reluctant to use it and actually put it into integrating their force planning. And the last point is that good practice matters. Again, as we've seen in Ukraine, Russian um, you know, sort of practice, frankly, sucks. I mean, they're out there on the, un you know, on the open, um, unclassified uh, net, picking up people's mobile phone because they, their own systems don't work. And we've seen that from everything, logistics, uh, maintenance, etc. Good practice, good hygiene matters and matters deeply in this realm in particular. So make sure you, that part of your job is done and not attend, you know, not sort of, you know, um, eaten away by things like cost effective, you know, cost measures and efficiency dividends, etc. In the maritime environment in particular, we've got a couple of you know, specific things. We do know that there are command and control bots, and we see this a lot and more in the civilian sectors around ports, etc., because things are becoming more automated. There's opportunity for spoofing of uh, navigation systems, collision control systems, etc. There's DOS attacks, not merely for disruption, but if you're having sensors and the greater the automation that your ships and your shipyards and your broader maritime system is using, the more energy drain is going to be undertaken. So it's not merely the fact that, again, you've got to think about energy on, on your platforms, et cetera. It's also what happens if that you've got to take account. Jammy, of course, you know, classic e-lint, um, is also occurring from land base or as we're getting to the autonomous vehicle side, you can sort of see this coming in, you know, again, small things coming in and affecting that, that, that operating environment of, of different platforms. And all this is happening because we're getting limited bandwidth. So again, it's hard, it can be hard for things to access ships um, because of that limited bandwidth. You don't, don't have the broad bandwidth you might have in a land-based system. That said, there's also limited response. If something happens, there's only so many, you can't just sort of, you know, call and get someone in for the sort of, you know, happens to live in the next town, next block. 
So making sure there's backup and capability to respond to these things is important. We're seeing increasing automation, and that's throughout the value chain. Uh, we're seeing that increasing threat surface as more sensors are brought in. And certainly just wandering the exhibition hall down there, I'm just, again, taken back by how many autonomous vehicles, how many different robotic systems, how many new sensors are being introduced and that, you just, you know, to take Admiral Selby's point, again, are going to be introduced because you're on that fast innovation cycle as well. All that's great. And again, one response to this is you have that fast innovation cycle and you adapt quickly because, frankly, it's the only way of getting ahead. And again, you've got to start thinking about that broader ecosystem. The last point is, is that it is all hybrid. The effect of cyber, as I said, is to erode um, trust, is to corrode decision making, it's to undermine certainty, it's to introduce that sort of the fogginess back, you know, class 50 and fogginess back into that environment. And so if there is something around cyber, you should always be saying, and what else? Is it lawfare? Is it the fishing vessels that are approaching, you know, again, in the, those ships? What else is there out there? Because this is not going to be a single point of attack. There is no one domain to, again, pick up General Campbell's point from yesterday, that's going to deliver that knockout blow. So very quickly, I'm just going to touch on the rise of hybrid here, because what we're seeing is, again, just this really sheer this messiness. Traditionally, we tend to think about, you know, and particularly the domains, you know, uh, forums like this, about conventional military power. And we think, right, we're going to go from, you know, the, we can see this in the region. That's what the Defence Strategic Update refers to, is that rising sort of uh, militarisation and military capability in the region. Uh, that's being driven by geopolitical competition and by technology advances. The problem is we also have to think about that socio-economic uh, cohesion in our environment. And again, we can make the same sort of saying, what's going happening? There's weak and there's strong players. And traditionally, that hybrid is we've always thought about that being the tool of the weak. But what we're seeing is a lot of those drivers in that broader environment are driving things to weakening those systems and cohesion, etc. So we're going to see more, it's, we're seeing strong players using the powers and the tools of the weak. We're seeing weak players trying to sort of grab a few things, activities and things of the strong, whether they're submarines or carriers or missiles in particular. And what we starting to see a very, very messy environment. Cyber is just part of that. And frankly, you know, again, just picking up the point about the narrative, I'm all in favour of narratives, but you have to, you know, narrative only has weight if you actually do and you, you know, people can see what you do. Um, adaptability, as I mentioned, is very important. That fast innovation cycle is going to become important. Picking up a point that Rory made this morning, resilience is going to be incredibly important, building that resilience. But that's not top-down command and control. That is actually doubling down on that democratic impulse and giving people agency. And that's one of the lessons, again, taking away from Ukraine, the people, the reason, the rationale, and the tools to be able to defend themselves and, 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 and realise that effect, on the, whether it's on the battlefield or in society. And the last thing I will say is having that strategic imagination. Um, pick up some earlier points today too. It's very important, whether it's all down the full stack, whether it's human, whether it's that broader ecosystem, whether it's the laws and structures, etc., that we actually apply to trying to bring some order and some certainty in that environment. Thank you. And finally, on to Commander Caroline Tucker. Um, good afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to um, be invited to speak here today. I've been um, asked to speak to you about some of the legal aspects of grey zone operations and focus on the utility of unmanned vessels. Those are clearly two huge topics in their own right. Um, however, as I'm sure many of you will appreciate, the role of a staff officer often involves taking enough information to fill a book and putting it onto a single page of A4, bullet points only, for your admiral. So that's effectively what I'm going to try and do in the next 10 minutes. My bottom line up front, to coin a military phase, is I've got two messages for you. Uh, firstly, the grey zone is complex, but actually, believe it or not, the law is your friend and it is an enabling factor. And secondly, if you look on the law as an enabler, then you can also look on unmanned vessels as a potential facilitator. But this wouldn't be a presentation from a lawyer if there wasn't some kind of caveat or health warning. 
Um, and my caveat is that I'm looking at this from an unashamedly legal perspective. And sadly, just because I say as a lawyer that I think I've got a couple of good ideas, clearly there are going to be a lot of policy and capability decisions that have to be taken into account as well. So I'd like to start by just quickly setting the scene. And I thought I'd use the title of this panel to look at the legal contest, the legal dispute, and the legal competition, because from there we can look at options. Is that not working? Uh, okay, so the slide has um, failed me, but we'll carry on anyway. Um, the legal contest, um, there we go. So the definition of a gray zone, there are several definitions out there, but um, I really, um, like the Australia Defence white paper definition of a grey zone. It's um, very logical and it neatly sums everything up. And I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting here in Sydney right now. The key point from the legal perspective is in red there, which is about the fact that the grey zone is all about not provoking conflict. This seems really obvious, I appreciate that. But from a legal perspective, that means we have to look at the law of peacetime for our operating parameters. And from that flows the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea as our umbrella treaty, but also uh, the international regulations to prevent collisions at sea, or COLREGs. And also, I'd like to consider the customary international law principles of state responsibility, because they also play a role. If we look at the legal dispute, um, we all know, particularly in the South and East China Seas, it starts from the issue of the sovereignty of land features. But the key part for us of mariners is about then access to the maritime zones. I'm sure for many of you, this is a very familiar graphic of the maritime claims in the Indo-Pacific region. And I'm not even going to try and untangle all those claims here today. I just wanted to show you the practical impact, because as mariners, we're concerned about the freedom of navigation. And our big worry is when that freedom of navigation is at risk of being restricted because of the claims made by countries in that region, in particular China. The legal competition um, is another area that we have to consider. So there's been a lot of talk about lawfare um, and what it actually means. It's been defined in the US as the strategy of using or misusing the law as a substitute for traditional means to achieve a war fighting objective. And there's a clear link to the definition of gray zone operations in that. Although the US coined the phrase, it's actually only China that's developed a formal doctrine of lawfare. Um, and a recent publication from 2015 from China defined it as achieving legal principle superiority and delegitimizing the adversary. So the difficulty I think um, we face is that often events at sea are termed as lawfare, but actually they're unlawful acts in themselves. To give you an example, the um, harassment of Philippine fishing vessels by um, Chinese militia out in the region, but also the use of lasers directed at members um, of the bridges of warships. So I would suggest that instead, look on lawfare, if you want to use that term, as the examination of the law as an enabler to help you support the rules-based international organization. And you can split that into two questions. Firstly, how do we counter unlawful activity? And then secondly, how do we bolster our own lawful activity? This leads us to two possible options, and this is not an exhaustive list. But if we look firstly at unlawful activity and how do we counter it, you have lawful countermeasures. And then if you want to bolster your own activity, then you have freedom of navigation operations. So for lawful countermeasures, this flows from the customary international law of state responsibility. And essentially what it means is states are responsible for acts attributable under international law by state organs, and that includes breaches. And an injured state might invoke countermeasures to induce compliance. I'll give you a practical example. Um, it's very well known that China does not consider that the right of innocent passage should be afforded to warships. And this is not a position that's adopted by states such as Australia, UK and the US. So let's say China tries to stop your warship of your state trying to conduct innocent passage in their territorial seas. Under the legal doctrine of uh, countermeasures, your state could then do the same back to China to try and induce compliance from them. A countermeasure is only lawful if it's non-forcible and it's got to be necessary and proportionate, and it's got to be in response to a breach of an international obligation, like the right of innocent passage under UNCLOS. The problem becomes, how would you enforce or monitor something like that? Because clearly, if you were going to try and stop a warship sailing into territorial seas, 
it might get a bit tasty out there and you might end up sailing your ship in a way that is in fact in breach of coal regs itself in order to impose that countermeasure. And this is possibly where an uncrewed vessel could help you out. With freedom of navigation operations, um, the two that are most popular or publicized are ones that challenge either an excessive jurisdictional claim, like the right of innocent passage, or one which challenges an excessive geographical claim, such as excessive baselines. Um, the picture on the right shows the straight baselines that China's declared around the Paracel Islands. So in 2018, HMS Albion sailed through in order to counter that claim. But the thing about freedom of navigation is it's not just about the big ships sailing through a contested zone. Freedom of navigation is much more than that. And UNCLOS provides you with several rights and privileges in the ocean that you can exercise. For example, the ability to conduct survey work in the exclusive economic zone, or flying operations, or man overboard drills. Essentially, every time a vessel sails out to sea, it's exercising the freedom of navigation. It's daily business. But freedom of navigation operations have to be competitive in order to demonstrate the legal element of state practice. And in fact, it's been reported to the US State Congress that the current average of roughly two a year of the US conducting freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea does not challenge the daily sovereignty assertions that are made by China. So again, this is where unmanned vessels could maybe help you out. If we look at the advantages first, I'm just going to start with the money because that's usually what people are generally interested in. Um, uncrewed vessels can be cheaper. There's a recent publication in the US which has said that the daily running costs of an Arleigh Burke is approximately $700,000 a day. Whereas the daily running costs of Sea Hunter, which is a US Navy large uncrewed vessel, is $20,000 a day. So if you translate that into lower cost, that gives your Navy an ability to generate more vessels and a higher mass and a greater presence at sea. There's also the advantage that maybe if you use an uncrewed vessel, particularly if you're gonna try and impose countermeasures, there's less risk because there's no manpower on board. Obviously, it's not all, all gonna be positive and there are negatives such as the fact that an uncrewed vessel could arguably be easier to steal. And this relates to the earlier point about um, uh, cyber security. And I just so that the, um, nobody felt left out, you could also use an uncrewed vessel for a hydrographic survey. So on the left, we have um, one of our survey vessels crewed, but on the right is the Otter Pro, which is an autonomous um, survey vessel that's much smaller, but can do great survey work in harbors and shallow waters. And I didn't want the aviators to feel left out, or indeed the Australians. So um, it's worth remembering that the right of overflight is provided for in UNCLOS. And so you could use a crewed um, aviation platform, or you could use an uncrewed one. The difficulty is maybe that a crewed warship has, makes a bolder statement than maybe something that is uncrewed. But I would counter that that is possible um, to still have an impact, provided you classify your equipment properly. And this is where we come into what's in a name. So under UNCLOS, it says that ships and vessels have the rights to the freedom of navigation. Um, so if a state wishes to exercise those rights, an unmanned system needs to be classified as either a vessel or a ship. I was quite shocked to find out when I first started working in this area that there is no single definition of ship or vessel in international shipping law. I got to 13 before I stopped. I love my job, I really do, but even I had enough. So there's no definition of ship or vessel, it's all different. And indeed, there's also no mention in international shipping law of vehicles or boats. But I would suggest that this ambiguity is a legal freedom which we can use, not misuse, to incorporate unmanned systems to define them as vessels. And so um, in here, we have two vessels that the Royal Navy are operating, and they are both registered on our defense shipping register as vessels so that they have full navigation rights. It matters because of freedom of navigation, but as military operators, there are two other key principles to bear in mind. And the first one is sovereign immunity. Um, sovereign immunity, as many of you will know, excludes the effect of certain treaties on our warships and government vessels. I like to explain this to um, the operators as, look on it as a bubble of protection. You should not be interfered with by another state when you're sailing along. And UNCLOS provides that warships and government vessels have sovereign immunity. So you go back to, you need to register it as a vessel. And indeed, the UK position is this immunity also extends to equipment, and that's a position that I know is certainly adopted by the US as well. 
I think this is particularly important in this context because of recent Chinese Coast Guard legislation, which authorises the Coast Guard to forcibly remove foreign vessels, including military ones, which appears to contradict the principle of sovereign immunity. But I would suggest to you it strengthens the case for using uncrewed vessels. I would personally much rather an uncrewed vessel was arrested, in inverted commas, than a patrol ship with Royal Navy personnel on board. And then finally, to paraphrase um, the Chief of the Defence Forces yesterday, should the worst happen, then we have to consider belligerent rights. Only a warship has belligerent rights under the law of naval warfare, and a warship is defined in UNCLOS Article 29. The UK view, which we established at the end of last year, is that it is possible to have an uncrewed warship and still support the principles of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and as of March this year, the US has also recently published doctrines, so they take the same view. This is just planning for worst case scenario. None of us want to go into a conflict, but um, to coin a naval uh, motto, if you want peace, you have to prepare for war. So to conclude, um, the law provides options to counter gray zone activity, but if a state wishes to facilitate those options and increase presence in a way that is without risk to manpower, then maybe uncrewed surface vessels are the way forward. But if you're going to do that and you want to establish a credible legal position in your operations, you've got to make sure you classify them properly. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll just say a few quick words here. I'll, I'll hand over to Captain Rhodes to run the, the Q&A, but we have uh, just shy of uh, a good half hour here. Um, Please, uh, please ask questions. Please get engaged in this session with the panel of experts you have before you. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll take questions, I think, via the app. Uh, yes, I'm, sir. I'm certainly happy to take any uh, with the hands up, probably from those a bit lower down where we can, can see while, we're, uh, while people are gathering their thoughts to, uh, to pose questions. Um, I might impose one rule if I can, having been around these conferences for a while. Uh, could we just restrict the commentary? In fact, could we get rid of any comments? Uh, the subject matter experts for this session are up here. Uh, so please tap into their uh, collective minds and uh, pose some questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, sir. Um, and the first question that we have is actually for Dr. Lee and Mr. Townsend. And uh, doctor, if I could ask the question to yourself first. Uh, and that question is, what must Australia and the United States do together in order to defeat Chinese grey zone tactics? And there's a second part to this, which is, what must Australia do by herself? Well, um, Nice and simple one for you there, sir. Look, look, I mean, the first thing we need to do, I think, is, is link issues. And when I say link issues, what I mean is, you know, my experience in government was when the Chinese did something, say, in the South China Sea, East China Sea, but more so the South China Sea at the time, you, you know, a, uh, people in the Defence Department would get together and work out the tactical manoeuvres and so on. They may consult with our foreign affairs to work out, you know, how to actually deal with this from a diplomatic point of view. And then that was the answer. And, and that doesn't really um, um, arm us properly, it's not the right word, but that doesn't really prepare us properly for some kind of grey zone response, whether it's a denial response or whether it's a cost imposition response, because we're just playing in a very linear field, a linear field, you know, what can our vessels do in response? We need to sort of link it to other tools of, um, of, of the country, which is what precisely what China does. Um, and, you know, the reason why I'm attracted to cost imposition, but not a linear cost imposition, but cost impositions in, in other areas that may be non-military or may not have anything to do with the maritime area for something that's done in the maritime space by China, is that if you don't do cost imposition, China just keeps trying because they haven't lost anything. I mean, they've lost reputation, but they don't care that much anymore. They haven't actually lost anything if there's no cost imposition in another way. So that's why... Um, I, I am attracted to you know, some notions of cost imposition. Um, the, the final thing I would say is, you know, I guess one step before that, we, we need to work out um, a, an idea of when we need to escalate and why, which is, which is um, the, the, the same sort of challenge that, or same sort of uh, question that 
you know, any sort of government has. You don't escalate over everything, but you do need to know precisely why you're escalating over this particular act uh, and, and why. Um, but my main, my main answer would be we need to organise ourselves in a much more whole of government way and link issues in a way that we haven't really done up till now. Thanks, Doctor. Mr Turner? Um, so I think this question, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could take it, and I, I agree with everything John just said. I, I think the, the heart of the question is about alliance management. What, what does Australia and the US need to do together, and what, do they need, what does Australia need to do by itself? It kind of gets at that. Um, I, I would make the following two points. First, when it comes to what we need to do together, if a key element of Chinese strategy broadly in grey zone activities, you know, you might argue specifically, is about splitting countries from each other. You know, divided we fall, together we stand sort of mentality is the response to that. And that has to operate very strongly in an alliance context. Um, I think it was Kurt Campbell who made the point, and Secretary Blinken who made the point at the start of the Biden administration, that the US is not going to leave Australia on the field when it comes to economic coercion. Similar points have been made with regards to other elements of Chinese um, grey zone coercion in the region. I think that's a good example of the kind of mindset of solidarity, to go to something Rory discussed this morning as well, that is necessary in an alliance management context in order to make sure that there are no seams in the way you approach issues and indeed where there are seams that there are ways that you have as allies in working through them together. And a part of that is about the architecture of the alliance as well and in ensuring that in the very disparate parts of both of our systems there are the, the fastest and most effective ways of coordinating, sharing information in real time, responding and knowing how how we are going to respond, i.e. planning ahead of time when it comes to responding to a grey zone um, probe or, or some kind of grey zone challenge by China. Uh, I, you know, again, in the spirit of the question, what should Australia do by itself? What does it not need the United States for? Indeed, what might it not want the United States for? I would say that Australia can't wait for Washington in order to do as much as it possibly can to play a greater role in supporting regional countries in the Pacific and Southeast Asia across our immediate region in responding to their own grey zone challenges. There are a range of coordination problems between Australia and the US, but not only. Between Australia, the US, Japan is very active in this space, increasingly India and other parties, including European partners in the region. Those coordination problems need to be resolved, but nonetheless, as we've seen in recent news developments, there is a lot that Australia can and can do more of when it comes to supporting um, um, you know, capacity building, when it comes to supporting resilience building, um, sharing, providing critical infrastructure, securing it and so forth in the region. This is not the work of an alliance. It can be augmented by it, but fundamentally it's about Australia, I think, playing that more um, active role in defending a regional rules-based order that the Defence Strategic Update uh, signals is critical. Thanks, Ashley. Um, Professor Seebeck, the next question is directed to yourself and then Commander Tuckett, if I could ask you to provide comments uh, at the end. Uh, the next question is, at what point does a cyber attack deserve a kinetic response? Okay, okay thank you. Uh, previous Australian governments have made it clear uh, under the context of ANZUS that a major cyber attack on the United States would constitute a response under ANZUS. I frankly am finding it's hard to uh, envisage for all the reasons I've said, earl said earlier, but also because uh, the, uh, the, there is a real difficulty with attribution. Now, again, one of the lessons from Ukraine was that the uh, Western intelligence agencies have proven themselves to be very good at attribution. They know what Russian uh, behaviour and the cyber attacks uh, and activity in that realm look like, and they were getting out there front, you know, ahead of the game. And I think that's actually a much more uh, useful approach. The reason being, too, is that cyber is essentially a tool of intelligence at this point, and it is a shaping tool. It, should, you know, the, the, it is used to endeavour to shape the environment, whether it's a decision-making environment or the, uh, the use of capability. Uh, so to say that you know, such a tool is going to uh, trigger a kinetic response is actually a pretty big call in my estimation. That said, 
Uh, again, we're in this world where there is a lot of grey zone activity. We need to find out, figure out ways of actually deterring this effectively. Uh, and it may well be that we sort of say, okay, we actually start saying, yes, we know what some of this, sort of, you know, particularly in our region, Chinese activity looks like. We are very certain what it, you know, how, how we're going to respond. Is that going to be a kinetic attack? That's a very big call at this point in time. Uh, but what that also means is that we actually have to start thinking hard, as, our, as both John and Ashley have said, about what those other tools of statecraft are and how are we going to um, think about responding in such circumstances. Um, thank you for the, for the question. I think, first of all, I echo what you've just said, that it, it is a big call. Um, but also, I think it's a big call because you've got to get through the legal threshold of what is an attack first. So... Um, Every time you hear about cyber attacks in the press, it doesn't necessarily mean an attack in contravention of the UN Charter, which would invoke the right of self-defense under Article 51. Um, I'm now going to use the phrase that I hate using, but all lawyers do. It totally depends on the circumstances of the case. Um, and it is ultimately a state decision as to how they wish to define the attack in question. Um, but I would imagine that any government that is faced with a cyber incident and they will look at responses, if they want to raise a response up to the kinetic level, they're going to have to look at issues such as the level of damage caused, and I think in particular the amount of harm that has been done to civilian people as well as the military. And it's only once you've passed quite high thresholds there that most states would wish to invoke a kinetic response in, in response to a cyber attack. Thanks, Caroline. Admiral Jones, sir, the next one looks like it's got your name all over it. Uh, the question is, it's at the port that the Maritime Grey Zone comes into contact with land. So how is Maritime Border Command acting against the trafficking of people and other contraband at Australia's ports? Thanks, great question. Uh, it's not a Dorothy Dixer, but there's a colleague out there somewhere that is challenging me. <laughs> um, someone once said to me that 80% of maritime security is conducted on land, so uh, that forms part of the, the answer. Uh, the land might be in faraway places though. So in Maritime Border Command and indeed in the Australian Border Force, we talk often about layers to the border and that the border starts offshore. So um, it, the intelligence and queuing for all manner of um, illegal activity, contraband, whatever it might be, starts offshore. Uh, and, and ends, um, per the question, at uh, ports, be they seaports or, uh, or airports. Uh, I see, in my current role, I see every day the statistics rolling in through the day uh, about the seizure of various forms of contraband and, and the contraband definition, if you like, in this case, is quite expansive. Um, I, I see activity every day, so clearly we're doing something right. I'm not so naive as to think that uh, we, we uh, managed to intercept 100% of, uh, of uh, illegal goods entering the country. But when you see it firsthand, though, it is quite striking um, how successful we, we be. I can't give you the statistics, but, um, but the answer to the question is it starts offshore. Uh, it is partly intelligence, um, but it is equally engagement with our partners um, and uh, you know, marketing and advertising campaigns, strategic communications, if you wish to call it that, about what is acceptable and not acceptable to enter the country. And that applies across the board. That can apply to maritime people smuggling as much as it can to cigarettes uh, and... Uh, um, and other forms of, uh, of contraband that enter the country. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is for the entire panel. So, uh, Commander Tuckett, if I could ask you to answer this question first and then we'll just move along the panel. And that question is, how might Australia use cyber tactics coercively? Uh, wow, so my um, ability to conduct any kind of cyber tactic is limited to a basic operation of PowerPoint, but um, <laughs> I think... <laughs> Um, I'm, I, I'm going to give a list of negatives, if you like, and then I'm going to leave it to, you, to the experts. Uh, firstly, whatever Australia does has to be within the bounds of international law, which is, you know, as per my presentation, there is stuff happening in the Indo-Pacific region that is definitely breaking the law. So it can't be something that could be constituted as a use of force. Um, 
it might also should not be something that constitutes a breach of sovereignty. Different states have different positions on this, but it'd be worth considering. So if you're going to use cyber tactics, it's more likely to be in the influence space and the information operations space than um, something that causes physical damage, because as per the earlier question, that could be viewed as an attack. Okay. Yeah, I, I defer to my legal colleague uh, on the right. <laughs> um, I, again, this is something I think we're going to have to take a leap and say we might be already in conflict. Um, in part because uh, when you use cyber, you're introducing greater uncertainty in the environment. You're making it more complex. You're making it uh, inchoate. You're adding to the fogginess of war. And you have to ask yourself the question, do you really want to do that? Uh, because you might need clarity, you might need the other side to um, you know, have clarity about your intentions in particular, and cyber can, you know, can fog that up and uh, make that very hard and indistinct. That said, they, again, what we're seeing, again, I defer to the experience we're seeing in the Ukraine at the moment, or in Ukraine at the moment, whereby uh, cyber is being used as a tool of denial, um, and that's quite, you know, quite useful. Uh, not least in terms of things like, again, this is where it bleeds over into the civilian sector, the uh, Russian tractors or the tractors that the Russians took back to, um, from Ukraine to Russia were switched off because they were, you know, basically had, there was a dead man switch in them um, that John Deere operated. It's very much in the information warfare space as well. You're starting to see, again, collection of uh, personal information about um, individual Russian soldiers and that being used. Uh, to you know, contact their mothers and say, do you know what your sons are doing? So it very much does play in that information warfare space. For democracy, however, this is actually quite tenuous territory. Uh, and if you watch, you see where cyber is being mainly used by authoritarian society, it's against its own people. So this is where I say it's critical that we double down on that democratic imp impulse and we actually put in very strong provisions because it's a very slippery slope that you tend to go down. Once you can do it, you know, one jurisdiction, then it becomes very easy, particularly when you've got the data and the platforms and the sort of the information power to use it in others. So I think this is something you have to use with a great deal of care for a whole range of reasons. Again, also deferring to the legal expert and cyber expert to my right, uh, and, and Leslie, I was, I was going to try and make the point about you know, how can cyber tactics be used coercively in a denial context? Uh, and you did touch on two of the two things I was going to say. But uh, I think just briefly, um, when it comes to um, the use of cyber in the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of being, uh, again, in, in non-legal territory myself, but being very useful um, short of conflict or short of the triggering of escalation of conflict activities that we could use in places in disputed parts of maritime Southeast Asia and dis disputed parts of the region more broadly as a way of undercutting um, 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 Chinese expanding presence and the time on station that Chinese state vessels or maritime militias or something in between can spend there. There is a lot of advantage there that can be exploited by those of us that are numerically inferior, even if technologically in these areas we still have advantages that are asymmetric and useful. What that triggers and how to manage escalation is, I think as Leslie was suggesting, entirely another question and something that we should, of course, think hard about, but it's already the case, as is reported, that China is using um, 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 many of these tools against Australian aircraft, against aircraft and ships of all nationalities in parts of the South China Sea. So it wouldn't be that we, it, it would be something that is playing into an existing dynamic. I think equally when it comes to the questions about influence and information operations, there might be lessons from law enforcement um, that can be applied that are generally undertaken domestically to an international context when it comes to revealing and building influence through the targeted or selected um, a public or private reveal of information that an adversary or a competitor um, might not want known in a certain target state in the region. For example, we often have good ideas about the way that influence networks that are perhaps not military in nature operate in parts of the South Pacific um, uh, that link back 
through intricate webs of commercial and political organisations to a united front operation or something like that. We might also have access in other parts of our system to information about some common individuals within united front operations um, but are accessible to us through companies that might be registered in their names in Australia that would be governed or the authorities around which might be governed by Austrac. Um, it's not necessarily the case that in the context of you know, international um, grey zone competition that we can link those things up. But when it comes to melding capabilities that we have in the cyber domain uh, and the information space and the use of, uh, of, 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 of that uh, to place pressure on an individual or a corporation to accede to a demand that we might have or a request um, for a decision to be not taken or taken in the South Pacific, and I know I'm starting to tie myself up in knots here a little bit, um, you can clearly see where that sort of leverage can be built. Again, that gets us into murky territory. I won't even ask what the legal perspective is on it, but I think that these other kinds of things, and if you look back at the interwar period in particular in the European, you know, European context, uh, although, although without the technology, these are the kinds of things that were the, you know, the story of novels, the, 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 the purview of intelligence operators at the time and I think something which is now applicable much more broadly across our system. Um, I'll answer the question by, by saying why it's difficult to answer the question. Um, you know, if you think about a coercive cyber action, you know, and I assume it's against an advanced enemy, you can basically assume you're going to get something in retaliation and it goes back and forth. And basically, it's almost impossible to game play how it turns out because, one, you don't know how resilient your system is, particularly ours where there's a lot of private sector elements involved. And we don't know how resilient China's system or Russia's system might be when we do it. Um, the, the second problem with answering the question is that, you know, a country like Australia would ideally prefer to do, um, you know, genuinely coercive cyber operations collectively um, rather than by ourselves. But and would obviously look to the United States in, in, in most situations. I mean, but part of the problem that goes back to the legal and regulatory aspects, the United States, my understanding, would have far more permissive cyber uh, coercive regime than, say, we would, or at least interpret uh, international law in a far more permissive way than we would, just given the nature of the role that the United States plays in the, in the national system. So that makes sort of coordination and cooperation quite difficult as well. And so what we're left with is that, you know, cyber will tend to remain, um, or the easiest way to imagine cyber being used coercively is, is during the first rounds or the first exchanges in what will be kinetic warfare. Um, and, and then kinetic warfare proceeds. I know it won't always be that way, but I get the sense that it's still largely, or we're still largely in that kind of situation. Yeah, I deferred uh, originally to the lawyer's perspective as well, which is the answer to the question is very carefully. Um, but the operations perspective is that good cyber operations lack attribution. They are very ambiguous. Um, which doesn't necessarily lend itself to being the, the sole purveyor of coercive uh, or coercion or a coercive event. So um, to the very point of uh, all cyber is hybrid uh, and to CDF's point yesterday about the idea of integrated operations, integrated uh, campaigning, uh, it would be more likely that um, there would be another lead form of coercive activity that might be synchronised with a cyber element. Thanks, sir. Panellists, uh, thank you very much for your time today um, and for your insights into what are really complex and complicated problems. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We're now going to take a break for about half an hour and I'll see you back in here at 1500 for our last session of the day. <laughs>